Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the illegality of the war in Gaza and the utility or lack thereof of international law. Our guest, John Quigley, is Professor Emeritus of International Law at Ohio State University. Quigley's books include The Statehood of Palestine, International Law in the Middle East Conflict from Cambridge University Press. John Quigley, welcome to Talk World Radio. What laws are being violated by Israel at the moment? Um, There are several. Uh, One is the law regarding the taking of territory. That is, uh, Israel took the territory of both Gaza Strip and the West Bank in 1967. Um, It did so without any just cause, and it has remained ever since. The International Court of Justice has said that its presence in those territories is unlawful and that it must leave immediately. Uh, so that that's one body of law. Um, there's another body of law that relates to the methods of warfare, um, and that says that civilians have to be spared uh, to the extent feasible. That, uh, to put it another way, one can only target military objectives, um, uh, and must do so in a way that does not inordinately harm civilians. Um, That is being violated by Israel. So that's a second body uh, of of law. Um, There's also a convention on genocide, uh, which is being violated by Israel. Um, That makes it a uh, a, a crime and uh, an act that is unlawful for a state uh, to create conditions of life that are calculated to bring about the physical destruction of a population group. Um, so that's being violated. So yeah, so I can think of three. <laughs> can I can I ask about a possible fourth? Um, am I? Am I correct that the United Nations Charter bans war with a couple of narrow loopholes not being met here? Yes, that would relate to the first reason I gave. That is that the war was conducted in 1967 uh, in a way that did not involve self-defense on Israel's part, did not involve the UN Security Council organizing a peacekeeping uh, or, or uh, uh, actually a war making uh, uh, effort. So you, you're correct. What about those arming Israel and funding Israel and supporting Israel? Or how do they stand with the law? Well, the International Court of Justice uh, has said not only that Israel can't be in Gaza and the West Bank lawfully. Um, It has said that other states are prohibited from any action whereby they facilitate the presence of Israel in those territories. So the states that are giving um, uh, financial assistance or are providing arms, uh, or whether they're you know, private companies that are providing arms, that they're allowing to provide arms, uh, all, all of that is illegal. And what has been done about it thus far? I, I know m- millions of us raised as much hell as we could to get a nation to take the genocide case to the International Court of Justice, and South Africa finally did, and others finally signed on in support one after another. But what uh, what has become of that, and what else has been done? Well, that case, unfortunately, is going to take a while to go through the court. Um, South Africa actually uh, has the deadline of October 28th to file its main argument in the case. Um, 
And then Israel will object that the court doesn't have proper jurisdiction and they'll argue about that for maybe six months. Um, uh, and so that, that will go on for maybe two years uh, total. Um, but the executive arms of the UN, the Security Council, the General Assembly, uh, have an obligation to enforce what the court says. And the court has already said that, at least on a prima facie basis, genocide is being committed by Israel. And that Israel needs to cease and uh and desist the, the genocidal-ish behaviors, right? Precisely. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what can be done to advance that. What about the International Criminal Court where a prosecutor has asked for arrest warrants and they are taking endless sweet time to produce them? <clears throat> well, but, yeah, that doesn't impact Israel as such. It impacts the, the two individuals uh, that have been the subject of the request for the arrest warrants. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, in a sense, nothing that is done in the International Criminal Court is going to have any direct uh, legal consequence other than that other states would be obligated to turn those people in if they if they show up in their territory. Um, uh, but the Security Council and the General Assembly uh, can act on the basis of, of the present situation. The Security Council obviously is not likely uh, because of the United States position uh, in support of Israel, um, but the General Assembly could well do something quite significant. Um, and it surprises me that not more has been done in the General Assembly. Uh, the states of the General Assembly could organize uh, economic uh, sanctions against Israel, uh, in fact, I mean, the International Court has called for economic <laughs> sanctions, um, uh, so it wouldn't be going beyond what the court has already said is legally required. Um, the General Assembly could organize a peacekeeping force. It could send a force into Gaza to protect the population. Um, that would be not very much different from what the General Assembly did in 1956 when Israel uh, on that occasion went into Gaza unlawfully um, uh, and then did pull out under pressure from the United States. Uh, and at that point, the General Assembly set up a peacekeeping force uh, that functioned on the frontier between Gaza and Israel. Uh, so there's good precedent for the General Assembly taking a much stronger position than anything it uh, has done so far. The, uh, is, it could legally apply sanctions to those arming Israel and supporting the war, that those governments providing the weaponry if it wanted to, right? Yes, yes, certainly the the uh, General Assembly could could organize that. That that at this point is principally um, Germany and the United States. And it could expel Israel from the United Nations if it saw fit. Could it not? It could, and and that's something that is being discussed as as a possibility that 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 could be raised in the General Assembly. And it could send an unarmed peacekeeping force if it uh, if it agreed with those nuts like myself who believe that would be wisdom rather than insanity if it so chose, right? Yes, yeah, it could send in a force that either was armed or is not armed um, uh, and simply you know occupy positions uh, to prevent 
the uh, uh, IDF from uh, bombing, hopefully. <laughs> And when when the General Assembly tries to uh, circumvent uh, injustice or inaction in the Security Council, people often refer to this resolution called Uniting for Peace. Can you can you explain how that works? Yes, uh, that would be the basis on which the General Assembly could act. Um, this is a resolution. It's resolution number 377. Uh, dating from 1950, adopted by the General Assembly, um, which says that if the Security Council is prevented from dealing with a war type situation as a result of veto in the Security Council, that the General Assembly can recommend to the member states that they take the kind of action that could otherwise be taken by the Security Council, that is to enforce the, the peace. Um, uh, and and that, that dates from the time of the Korean War when it was used and when the General Assembly did precisely that. Uh, and that was the basis on which war was conducted in Korea for about three years. And if the General Assembly were to vote, a majority or, or two thirds maybe is required, but were to vote sufficiently for these measures we've been talking about, uh, sanctions, expulsion, peacekeepers, would those things immediately happen or would this be a rhetorical statement and the United States would still get its way? It would depend on whether there are enough states that would be willing to participate because that kind of a resolution would be a recommendation. It wouldn't have binding force on anyone. It wouldn't require any particular UN member to you know, send troops. Um, uh, so it would work only if there was a, uh, a sufficient number of states that were willing to uh, contribute to such a force and to, uh, to organize it. When in terms of something like expelling Israel from the United Nations, that doesn't seem to require a numerical force. Uh, it, it, does, it doesn't right. require. If the General Assembly voted overwhelmingly using United for Peace to expel Israel from the United Nations, oh. that not happen unless a sufficient number of countries provided a sufficient number of staff people to do the paperwork or, or what? No, the expulsion would not happen under the Uniting for Peace resolution. It would uh, not. That would happen uh, simply under Article uh, 6 of the Charter, which says that uh, a member can be expelled. And that is subject to veto or not subject? No, no, not subject to veto. Okay. Um, very good to know. Um, there are there are of course lots of votes the general assembly takes you know the entire world votes to end the the embargo on cuba or something and and nothing comes of it um so i'm just curious when the general assembly acts in which cases does it does it actually lead to an outcome well if it were a decision under uniting for peace to set up a some kind of a Peace force. Um, that would require, as I say, the support of states that are willing to go ahead and do that. Uh, if it is a vote to expel Israel from the United Nations, it's a different matter. That's not a recommendation. The, the General Assembly has control over membership, either to admit or to expel. Uh, so when it votes to admit, a state is admitted. Uh, when it votes to expel, a state is expelled. Good. Very good to know. Um, we're speaking with John Quigley, who is Professor uh, Emeritus of International Law at Ohio State University. John Quigley, what can ordinary people who care about the world 
do to advance the positive use of international law in this crisis? Well, I think they can put pressure on their governments. Um, uh, there's probably a, a greater role for people who are in countries that might actually take some action <laughs> uh, in, in this regard, um, uh, since the United States is not likely to, to do so. Um, but, uh, to, but I think there is a role for citizens everywhere, because to the extent that governments are, are seeing that they um, uh, are acting in ways that e evoke, you know, a negative reaction from the populace, um, you know, th that, that does make them think twice. Mm -hmm. Um, so a, a lot of organizations are generating emails and phone calls and visits to governments and to their representatives at the UN asking for just these things. Um, you think more of that is appropriate? I think so. I think that's very helpful. Um, uh, and even, you know, if governments in where the Middle East or elsewhere see that there is huge public sentiment um, uh, against what is going on. I, I think that all helps. And, and governments that reply, really, it should be Palestine to take the lead on this. It's not our place to uphold the rule of law or oppose genocide if we defer to uh, the Palestinians to, to take the lead and do something on this, and then we'll help. What, what would you reply to that? Well, I think, you know, Palestine can raise these things, but in and of itself, it, it can't really affect things on the ground, at least in the current uh, situation. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the status of international law seems to me to be in a little bit of trouble. Um, most people I raise the topic with seem to think it's a, a tool of certain powerful interests. It's not a universal standard uh, blindly applied to all equally and fairly. Um, what's, your, what's your take on the, the rising or falling of the status of international law? Well, I, I think this whole situation has it has developed over the past year um, has raised very legitimate questions about the role of international law, uh, because we see a, a population that is being you know decimated in ways that um, we haven't seen before in modern times. Um, uh, and with a major power supplying the weaponry to do so. Um, uh, and the institutions have not done anything to stop it. So I think it's quite legitimate to question <laughs> the efficacy of the institutions. The, uh, the International Criminal Court, uh, you say, is not particularly useful in this case. Um, but it seems to have had a reputation for extreme bias since long before this case. I, I'm not sure it's prosecuted anyone uh, who was not from Africa. Um, does it, I mean, does this not harm the very idea of international law to have these institutions used in this way? Uh, yes, it, it is very harmful to have institutions that on the face of them are neutral and apply principles that are universal. Uh, but then when one sees how they actually operate, it, it doesn't work out that way. Um, and that's been particularly true with regard to how the court has dealt with Palestine. Uh, because the government of Palestine, you were asking a few moments ago what the government of Palestine can do. In 2009, the government of Palestine went to the International Criminal Court. Uh, this was at the time uh, of an assault by Israel into Gaza uh, that occurred at the end of 2008. Um, 
and the government of Palestine went to the International Criminal Court and said to the prosecutor, please investigate for violations of the laws of war uh, committed by the Israel Defense Force. Um, uh, and the court basically didn't act uh, on that, uh, not, by, not because it said that what Israel was doing was lawful, uh, but because it said that Palestine could not uh, did not have the legal capacity to raise a matter in the International Criminal Court um, uh, because it hadn't been decided whether Palestine is a state uh, and only states can confer jurisdiction on the International uh, Criminal Court. Um, uh, and the prosecutor was much, you know, uh, well, less than forthright, let's put it that way, uh, in dealing with the matter, because he said initially, this is now 2009, um, I, I need a bit of time to figure out what Palestine's status is and whether it is a state. Um, and he didn't actually say anything more than that for about three years. Um, at which point he said, I am not the one to decide whether Palestine is a state. This is after he had been for three years saying, I am in process of deciding whether Palestine is a state. And at the end of three years, he says, it's not my role to do that, <laughs> which uh, you know, throws into question the bona fides of, of, the, or, of, the, of the prosecutor's office. I mean, if he was the one who, who could not make that call, he sh should have known that in 2009. It didn't take three years to figure out that it was not for him to say. Um, it actually is for him to say. Uh, he was avoiding the question because it was obvious that Palestine is regarded as a state, uh, and he, he just didn't want to deal with it. We could also suspect he might be under some uh, unwarranted pressure from various sources. Did we not absolutely know for a fact that he was because the United States has pressured the International Criminal Court by putting sanctions on its staff people uh, and, and otherwise threatening its operations if it did things that the US government opposed? Isn't that right? Yes, those things that you're talking about uh, came to light a bit later. So it's not known with certainty whether that kind of pressure was being put on the prosecutor in 2009, 2010. But uh, there's, there's good reason to suspect it was. What about international law in U.S. law. I mean, there are numerous U.S. laws that in theory put international treaties into place in the U.S. code. And I, I mean, I've seen lists of eight, nine, 10, 11 U.S. laws supposedly being violated by every shipment of, of weapons to Israel, uh, including the Leahy law, according to, among other people, former Senator Leahy. Yeah, this is a, a, a rather uh, sordid tale, actually, because this was raised by President Biden early in the current year, um, uh, requiring that the uh, uh, State Department look into the matter and make a determination as to whether or not the weapons that we, apply, we supply to Israel are being used in a way that violates international law because there is, as you, you say, a provision in US law that says in that circumstance, the weapons are not to be uh, supplied. So the State Department did a study, uh, this is in the spring, uh, and said, well, we're not sure. We can't uh, affirm that the weapons that we supply are being used unlawfully. Um, so, nothing was done to implement that U.S. law. Uh, a number of State Department people have uh, resigned over this. What U.S. laws are being violated? Well, U.S. 
uh, weaponry is not supposed to be used in a way that violates the law. That goes back to uh, some legislation that Congress enacted regarding Central America in the 1980s when we were supplying the Contras. Um, and a determination was made by the Biden administration early in 2024 that a determination should be made as to whether or not the arms that we supplied to Israel are uh, in violation of that legislation. Uh, and the State Department was tasked with studying the matter. Um, uh, and the State Department eventually came up saying, uh, it's all fine and, and wonderful. That is, we can't make a determination that the weaponry is being used in a way that violates uh, international humanitarian law. Um, so that's the way it stands at the present time. Now, it later came to light that before that call was made by the Department of State, the matter had been studied by several, you know, sub entities within the State Department that had concluded just the opposite, uh, and that the call had been made at the top level in the State Department to say that uh, the State Department couldn't determine that any of the weaponry was being used unlawfully. Or in plain language, the Secretary of State lied to Congress about what the State Department knew. Uh, yeah, yeah, that that's the way you're stating it. Yes, <laughs> I stated the same thing a bit more politely. Okay, I, 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 I politeness is not the highest value here at the moment. <laughs> uh, I think avoiding deaths is a little is a little <laughs> higher. Um, John, quickly, we're just uh, about out of time. Uh, there are there are elections in the United States. Are they gonna gonna change anything uh, for the better or worse here? Um, unfortunately, there is not reason for optimism um, in, in terms of the election. There doesn't seem to be uh, a, an inclination on the part of, of, of Ms. Harris to do anything that's different. Now, that could change. It could be that she's being reticent because she doesn't want to cross President Biden. It could be re that she's reticent for reasons that are based on her calculation about <laughs> how different decisions on her part might affect the vote. Um, uh, if it were uh, Mr. Trump who's reelected, I, I think he would be inclined to, to, to let Israel do what it wants, although um, he does have more concern, I think, about the monetary side, ab about the continuing uh, supply. So, you know, it, it, it's hard to say whether anything uh, could, could change as a result of the election. We shall soon see. John Quigley, Professor Emeritus of International Law at Ohio State, thanks for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.